This is Pod Populi. Podcast for the people. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. Hi again, everyone. It's Brian Howie. Welcome to The Great Love Debate, the world's number one dating and relationship podcast. Since 2015, I am back here in the very fine studios of Pod Populi, podcast for the people. I am at the one in Scottsdale, Arizona. I think last time I recorded here, I said that the temperature outside was surface of the sun. Now I think the temperature outside is core of the sun. So (laughs) I'm not sure we're going in the right direction (laughs) here. Um, We talk about a lot of things on this show and what we want and why we want it and how to get it and all those kind of things. Last episode, I talked about what exactly mentally and emotionally that was. Today, I kind of want to talk about physically. And if there's anything physically that either causes us to bond to another human being or causes us to want to bond to another human being. So this is a little bit above my pay grade. So early this morning, I shouted out, is there a doctor in the house? And uh, coincidentally and or fortuitously, there is. He has all kinds of um, expertise, and he's got some very strong opinions, and he's got some innovative uh, and interesting ideas when it comes to the love, dating, and relationship stuff. He is the author of Sugar Crush, which is going to change your life. Um, Hopefully, it'll rewire the way your physiological makeup is. And the new book is called Unglued, and a podcast of the same name, Dr. Rick Jacoby, how are you? I'm great. That was a great intro. I think you got the core temperature of this town. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I know. I mean, I guess that's why they call it summer. Somebody in Scottsdale made the comment that, thank God, it does get hot this hot or everybody would live here. That's probably why. Yeah. Yeah. If it wasn't this hot, it's very nice when it's not this hot. But when it's this hot, it scares all of us uh, New Yorkers and Californians away. So um, if somebody's bitten by the love bug... You were telling me that that's actually a real thing. Like that's that that's not just some uh, fairy tale made up uh, phenomena. That's something that you you say happens to us physically. Yes. So this is really a concept that you can read in Super Gut by uh, William Davis, who wrote Wheat Belly. So I read his original book Wheat Belly years ago, and I use some of his material in my book Sugar Crush. My My thesis is that sugar causes neurologic changes, and in the gut is where it starts. And there is an organism called the love bug, and that is uh, an organism, uh, one of a thousand, by the way. There's a thousand organisms live in the gut. They produce lots of different things, and this one, Ruteri, is the one that produces oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love bug because it raises our desire for communication and bonding. Mm -hmm. And women know that more than we. So if you want to get a guy, you got to raise his uh, oxytocin levels high. You can actually make him want to shop. You can make him want to shop. (laughs) Yes, that's it. (laughs) Yes, he will want to shop if you control him with the food that you give him and make sure those bugs that you retire organism produces that level of oxytocin is and oxytocin is related to sugar how well these all these organisms live in the gut the small intestine Uh so let me let me go way back so when i was writing sugar crush i came up with the concept that all these neurologic diseases we hear about every day from carpal tunnel diabetic neuropathy ms autism it goes on and on and on where is this sugar coming from well we have a desire for sugar we love sugar and so do bacteria bacteria love sugar Mm -hmm. so they're going to force you to eat what they like not what you really want Mm -hmm. human beings are carnivores they eat fat they do not eat sugar now let me define what sugar is there's a lot of sugars mantos Mm -hmm. galactose fructose glucose glucose is not sweet Hmm. You would not desire glucose. You only need one teaspoon, four grams at any one time. Anything over that is toxic. So what did they do? They tricked us. They took table sugar, which is a disaccharide, meaning two sugars put together, fructose and glucose. 
fructose is sweet. Mm -hmm. I want to eat more and more and more of that. Well, my glucose goes up, produces insulin. The gut bacteria say, oh, he wants or she wants glucose. And those organisms start to grow that need that. And one of those that needs the opposite is the um, rutiri species. So your need for oxytocin or your production of oxytocin goes down. So you're miserable. And that causes women to gain weight, men mm-hmm. to gain weight, and they're they're not on the same wavelength, basically. And that's why we call them our sweetheart. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so that's true. Um oxytocin, we have kind of generally kicked that term around every once in a while somebody comes in and, and drops it. Women produce a higher level of oxytocin naturally, and then when they bond with another man, it increases um, at a higher rate than men, or is that not true? That's true. Oh, that is true. Wow. Fun yeah. fact, everybody. Yeah, so the the reason they know that, because during pregnancy, that's mm-hmm. when that does that. And so what it one of its functions is to relax ligaments. Mm-hmm. So the birth canal has to be relaxed. And if it's not, then that we have a problem with delivery. Mm-hmm. So it's an automatic, so it causes a relaxation and a openness, no pun intended, for communication. Mm-hmm. And the male, if he has a higher level of that, mm-hmm. then he will too, so there's a bonding. That's why I say he'll more apt to shop. <laughs> Can oxytocin be produced um, artificially? Can I take an oxytocin pill? I don't know if that's true or not, but let's I'm, get on that, doctors. <laughs> um, if you have higher levels, are, are there ways to increase your level of oxytocin? You can increase it or decrease it by diet without bonding, and then will the oxytocin oxytocin then, um, like ecstasy, create a desire to bond with another human being, or does it only get produced once you do an action? It does that all make sense? has to oh. yes, it does. It all has to do with the food you're eating. If you're feeding those organisms that want that molecule, then mm-hmm. that will go up. If you feed it what they don't want, it'll go down. So men and women, instead of being at the bar in the restaurant, they should walk around and see who is eating uh, food that's going to produce oxytocin oh, and they're more got, likely to bond with it? I'm on to something, right? You are. you got a concept <laughs> where, oh, yeah, I can see that right like, now. Oh, look, she looked at the dessert menu. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are, the, what are the types? Is it just sugar? Is it bad foods are correlated to this? Is that, of course, it well, is? Well, the fundamental men are carnivores. Mm-hmm. So let's break that apart because women although do like meat Mm -hmm. are not as addicted to meat as men are and physiologically and anthropologically men get up in the morning let's go back a hundred thousand years ago Mm -hmm. they step out of the cave they scratch their ass they stand where's the next meal right they gotta go hunt Uh they may be gone for two weeks Meanwhile, the female's in the cave with 12 babies. She's got to feed them. Mm -hmm. So fermented foods, what you can find around the cave, tubers, potatoes, whatever. So she's more attuned to be a um, a vegetarian to feed her kids. But bottom line, we as humans, we need B12. If we don't get B12, we're going to have anemia and all sorts of neurologic diseases. Mm-hmm. We've got to get meat, carnivore. So there's an automatic divide in our diets between men and women. We need meat. Mm-hmm. We need the B12. And they have an app to produce more oxytocin than we could because we don't have that physiologic need for it. Mm-hmm. Because we get the meat in the B12. We get the B12. We don't deliver, obviously, so we don't know what that feeling of oxytocin is. Now, you ask, is there a synthetic? Yes, oxy- I misspoke there. Can you get it? Actually, you can. Can I get it at CVS? Uh, I think you need uh, a GNC? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there is a, a what they call trochies. They're little, like, uh, drug pouch you put between your gum and your lip, and... Um, you can put different things in, or like Cialis and oxytocin and other things. And some people do this mm-hmm. to give them a sense of euphoria and connection. And that's why I always say, you do that, you're, you're going to want to shop with them. Uh-huh. Normally, you would not do that. Okay. So, okay. Hear that, ladies. Not to be sexist, but <laughs> hear that, ladies. Um, we want more oxytocin, or it confuses the brain and the heart and the body? I think it's a natural occurring 
we're, we're just not getting it normal with the grain-based diet that we in, in the the sad diet standard american diet mm-hmm. so women now um, women control the the palate so to speak they mm-hmm. control the used to control the dinner table so they could make the meal that could produce that they're mm-hmm. not doing that now we're all eating out we all are in the fast food world mm-hmm. so we're not getting that fuel that we need for that so the american um food supply and or diet is for lack of a better term, junkier than just about anywhere else in the world. It is. So do we then have a different um, oxytocin reaction in this country simply because of what we eat? I think so. Yeah. If there's even a biblical verse, Leviticus, saying, whatever you feed man, I can control his mind. Okay, yeah. And you can. So Uh by what you eat. And who controls what we eat? Right now, I mean, we get into conspiracy theories, but we're eating grains. We're eating lots of sugar, Mm -hmm. uh, genetically modified foods. The vagus nerve is what's involved here. And those messages go up the vagus nerve to the hippocampus, the brain part that we interprets these things. Mm -hmm. And we're familiar with the little shop of horrors that play. Mm -hmm. Seymour, feed me. They're saying, feed me. They want sugar. Huh. They want sugar. They're going to kill you. They're going to make you feel bad. And hmm. that's why people, when they try to get off of carbohydrates, which is sugar, right. they feel lousy. I'm going to make you feel lousy. Don't you dare not feed me. I will make you feel lousy. I'll kill you. So we have you, a natural craving for things that are ultimately bad for us, but ex- satisfy us. Exactly. That's, so that's dating in a nutshell. That's, <laughs> well, <laughs> but that's... that's um, that's what we were taught. So there's a concept that sugar is a gateway drug. Right. Because what do we do? We give them formula, which is sugar. Breast milk is fat. That's what the kids should have, but we're, we give them sugar. So we have this cascade of more and more sugar, and that is a gateway drug to higher and higher levels of addiction of other euphoric causing drugs. Well, Pedialyte is closer to Gatorade than it is to anything that a baby should want, right? Absolutely. Abs- um, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, so we get hooked on it at a young age. I uh, hope you guys are hooked on this podcast. I got to take a quick break because we got to pay for um, not Pedialyte, but maybe some Gatorade around here. I'm with Dr. Rick Jacoby. We will be back right after this. And we are back and we are uh, swatting at the love bug around here. Um, a woman um, has uh, a physical, intimate moment with a man. What her body then instantly or the next day has the again not to stereotype, but we stereotype around here at the at the uh, great love debate. Um, she loves him. She likes him more. She feels connected to him more. What happens in those minutes, hours after a, a physical encounter? I think the oxytocin levels start to go up that feeling of connection goes up and that process is a mating signal. Mm -hmm. And that's why she feels that. Uh, And usually the meal that's surrounding that event is, has a lot to do with it and that can accentuate it or it could destroy that feeling as well. And that signal goes to the heart, the brain, the whole body. What, where's it, where's it, you brought up that nerve before, where's it going that, that, uh, I'm not saying it confuses her, but it it clouds judgment. I don't know, this rush of this naturally produced drug? Well, I think it it does. It goes, well, first of all, it's the vagus nerve. That's in Latin, the wandering nerve. So that nerve goes to every bodily function, autonomic function. Mm -hmm. So the liver, the pancreas, uh, the stomach, and then it goes up the vagus nerve to the brain, to, uh, to a structure called the hippocampus hippocampus is really latin for seahorse seahorse so you see that structure very small it looks like a seahorse and what does it do it says it stores memory now memory is very important because that oxytocin triggers that memory of the time and when all these family oriented events happened Mm -hmm. and that so that gives that person a feeling of connectedness and that's number one number two is the sense of smell olfactory nerve the nose Uh so when you're having a meal the smell of that meal also activates oxytocin and so that's another portion of it um 
since we have a doctor in the house, I'm going to ask all kinds of things. So what are, you brought up the smell thing. What are pheromones? Well, see, that's another thing. Pheromones are what we smell through the environment from trees. Um, that's the whole environment that I mean, you actually can communicate with trees by, by pheromones. That's what ayahuasca is all about, getting that. Uh, talking know, to the trees. Yeah, talking to the trees. Say no to drugs, kids. It's Fantasia. <laughs> that's Walt Disney. But a, a, a woman who is attracted to a man, a lot of times, that's what, it, that's what she's picking up on? The yeah, so scent, the natural musk of the man? Yes. Yeah, so you had the flowers. That's why flowers are important in relationships, because uh-huh. they're getting that sense of connection. Uh-huh. And all, these, all of these are part of that process. So first encounter with a woman usually is over a, me- a meal. Yeah. When you think about it. Yeah. Uh, so restaurants really don't cater to that anymore because they want to turn the tables quickly. Right. It's not a leisurely three hour date, get to know each other. Exactly. Let's get them in, get them out. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, which leads to less, uh, less of an encounter. Now, um, how long does the high probably isn't the right word, but we'll just use that the high of the oxytocin. How long does that last after a, 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 before it gets back to naturally occurring levels? Is it hours, days? It's probably in the sense of hours because it's related to the diet cycle. So it's, it, so it has to be continually done to keep that level high. Um, let's bring up the diet thing for a minute. Cause you're in fantastic shape. I don't know how old you are. You're slightly older than me. Um, Obviously, the key to dating is being attractive, I think. Yeah, it is. It's the key to dating is being attractive. I don't care about having a good personality. The key to dating is being attractive. Let's start there. And uh, (laughs) all of us need to be healthier. All of us. I don't care who who you are listening to this. We all need to be healthier. We all need to be in a bit better shape. And we all need to take better care of our bodies. I touched on it earlier. In America, even when we think we are eating healthy, just because we're not eating fast food and fast food is not good, there's so much crap in our food. When I go over to, I don't know, Europe, Asia, wherever, I eat a whole lot and I feel like I don't gain as much weight because I, I, I don't know. I just think the, the, the food is better. Not to get too controversial around here, but we are going to get controversial around here. What is different about the American bread? Oh, boy, you just opened up Pandora, <laughs> Pandora's box. Now, here's the simple... Lay off the bread, kids. So, I'm writing all the time reading. So I have writers on my staff and I have to explain this question like that. Mm -hmm. They don't understand. Well, maybe I didn't explain it right. So I have to dig deep into the answer. Well, let's, let's take a Ukraine war. Let's be political. Let's go. Ukraine is the breadbasket for Europe. Yes. Their flag, the blue and the yellow is literally the sky and the yellow is the grain. Is that right? You got it. Yeah. Okay. So let's start right there. Putin did not want John Deere and Monsanto, who offered Ukraine $14.5 billion about a week before the invasion, to put genetically modified food into Europe. Which is what we have. Exactly. And that's why you feel when you go like to Italy, mm-hmm. let, well, let's just take autism. And we did a podcast yesterday on autism. And that's a big woman's issue because... Mm-hmm. Essentially, the woman's going to get stuck with the caregiver, mm-hmm. no matter what we say. Right. We'll, we'll get a still traditionally that is the case. Right. We'll get yeah. a job at Circle K to make the money, but we're not going to change diapers. Let's face it. <laughs> Correct. Okay, we're not. So, the genetically modified food. And let, let's dig down on what is that stuff. So, glyphosate is the active ingredient that Monsanto makes to allow plants to grow with all the weeds around them being killed. So they genetically modified the corn crop, the seed. Mm -hmm. So you can grow that, spray it with uh, Roundup, which is uh, glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go into that word glyphosate itself. So this is the physiology behind it. So glycine is an amino acid, the most common amino acid in the human body. So you take glycine, glypho, and glyphosate, which is the phosphate, you attach that glyph- uh, that phosphate molecule to that, mm-hmm. gets into the genome, so it's impervious to the um, Roundup they're spraying. I just found this out a couple months ago. Of all the spraying on the corn crop, 
only one out of a thousand droplets hit the crop itself. The rest goes into the soil, gets washed down. And eventually goes to the Mississippi. Mississippi. So here's my metaphor analogy that I'll I'll give you to Mm -hmm. to answer the question. So, and some of this is in uh, William Davis' Davis's book, Super Gut. So let's take the Mississippi as a metaphor for the elementary canal, the human being. Mm-hmm. So we have the upper portion of the estuary is the Mississippi River, and then we have the stomach, then we have the small bowel. The small bowel is 24 foot long. The large colon is not that long. Mm. So the waste product, so let's say the effluent, down the Mississippi is down at the bottom, down towards New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, and, but that is starting to migrate up the Mississippi, up the bowel into the small intestine. That's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm-hmm. So now it's coming up that 24 miles feet of the small bowel. That's where nutrients are being absorbed. Now they're not absorbing nutrients, we're absorbing effluent. Mm -hmm. So the term for the entire absorption of the alimentary canal is called the fecalization of the alimentary canal. So I say, when I'm doing my lectures, Mm -hmm. does that mean Americans are full of shit? Yes. (laughs) Apparently. (laughs) Apparently. Hear that, great love listeners? That's the crux of it. (laughs) It is. So we're out there telling the world we're the greatest country in the world, Mm -hmm. which we are. Yeah, but you go to France, you go to Italy, and and you're eating all day. Yes. Oh my God! Mm-hmm. And they're skinny. Of course, they do smoke, and yeah, maybe they walk lo- more than we do, and mm-hmm. they drink wine all day long, and they're healthy. Autism, their autism levels are extremely low. This year, U.S. one in twenty births, one in twenty mm-hmm. have autistic characteristics. When I started my writing on this subject, it was mm-hmm. 16 births per 10,000 in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Is it meteorites causing this problem? Of course, it's got to be something simple. What is it? It's high fructose corn syrup. That's what's in every food item in the United States, made with glyphosate, and we're eating it at 85% of any grocery store. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. That's the answer. And... So we don't have the biggest population. Um, we're like fifth, fourth, fifth. In a, does the big population countries like India, China, do they not do the same thing to their food supply? Do they? Not? They do, yes, uh, they do. They have bigger population, of course, but percentage wise, they're going up. Now, I'm old enough. <laughs> I am old. So forty years ago, Surgeon General of the uh, Taiwan asked me to be go over there and figure out why they had diabetes Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, 1981. So his name is uh, Luke Chu. He's a medical doctor, got a PhD in pharmacology, four-star general, great guy, taught me how to play golf, really, Mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Um, Question was, why are we getting diabetes? I said, what's the word in Mandarin for diabetes? And he said, diabetes. I said, well, that's a Greek word. What's your word? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't really have one. Well, you didn't really have the disease either. So why would you need a word? It's sugar. Didn't know that in 1981. I was there till on and off till 83. And I I said, well, it's your diet. I don't know what's in the diet. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I'm thinking, what's different? Right. First fast food restaurant, 1979. I'm there in 81. And their numbers are going up. So the last day I was there... I'm in the 11th story of a research building. I, I took all the scientists. And they're smart people, and they're a lot of fun, mm-hmm. too, by the way. Take them over. Look down there. Here's a fast food restaurant. And you can see these kids. And everybody there is as skinny as can be. But the rich, real little kids mm-hmm. are fat. Mm-hmm. Coming out of this restaurant, I said, that's your problem. What's in that? I don't know but it's high fructose corn syrup. Now oh, everything that's good is bad for us. Exactly. The, uh, but we do, you know, even in, in the romantic sense, we give chocolates, we have little heart-shaped candies, we share a dessert together, we go out for ice cream, all of those things. It's romantic because it's sweet, but ultimately it, not only does it cause... Um, behavioral up and downs because we're so riddled with sugar it really causes um 
It's sort of a biological breakdown that we are not supposed to be doing this. We're not supposed to be consuming all of this. Exactly. And case in point, um, my granddaughter, she's 11, went to her play. It was on uh, Joseph Pulitzer. Mm-hmm. She was his secretary, Hannah, in the play. Wow. And it, it was really quite good. And she, she had a lot of fun. But, of course, you go out to eat afterwards, mm-hmm. traditional for all things like that. She wanted ice cream. Well, do I deny her on that? She and, No, have some ice cream. Can you have ice cream? Yes, fine. But this is what I said to her dad. I said, I'm going to buy her for her birthday, which is next week. I'm going to buy her ice cream making. Because think of the word ice cream. Mm-hmm. It's ice cream. Mm-hmm. There's no sugar in ice cream originally when Washington was eating it. He ate it every day. They took cream and uh-huh. he froze it. That's what it is. Well, ice cream today is ice sugar. It should be called ice sugar. I asked a guy who, one of my patients, who big company. Mm-hmm. I said, why don't you call it ice sugar? He laughed. Well, no one's going to buy that. Well, you're defrauding them. Yeah. Uh, you're- the, so the um, physiological downfall of the American public started with what? Coca-Cola? They I mean, have- is that the biggest influx of like a foreign... Um, burst of sugar that happened in this country? I would say so, because they did tremendous amount of advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, they laced it with cocaine, too. That helped. There you go. <laughs> Drink up, kids. Um, yeah, I agree with that. So if we want to, you know, this is not necessarily a dietary podcast, but everything is about feeling good and, and putting out the best version of yourself. Telling people to just quit sugar is unrealistic. Telling people to eat better is unrealistic. Is there one change that everybody pretty easily can make that will help them uh, 10% and probably uh, level off their moody moody swings? Yes. I was a sugar hog growing up. I did not know that. Now mm-hmm. I'm a doctor. I had my gallbladder out, I don't know, 25 years ago, maybe or more. And my mother had her gallbladder out. Well, what's the diet? Don't eat, don't eat fat. All of a sudden I realized and I... I was eating carbohydrates, but I went to the gym every day, so I looked good, I was strong, but inside I was not. Mm -hmm. Gallbladder is a muscle, just like your hand. Nerve is the vagus nerve again. Gallbladder doesn't empty. You get a stone, hurts like hell, and you have to take it out. The diet should be fat, not go off of fat, eat fat. That's what I do. So I put butter in my coffee, did 15 years ago. Put butter in your coffee? Oh yeah, there's a there's a football player who got drafted. Puts mayonnaise in his coffee. Same I saw kind. that. Yeah, I, well, I put, yes, and he's right because what? Oh yeah, yeah. what what is uh, mayonnaise? Egg and olive oil. It's probably better than sugar if you think about it. I mean, we sugar up our coffee. I mean, a lot of you out there, uh, uh, Starbucks fans, you're basically going for a milkshake when you're going at some of these. Oh, some of well, these. Well, let's drinks talk about getting. that. I, so I'm over at the hospital at, here in Scottsdale. And I'm sitting outside of Starbucks, and mostly women go to Starbucks. I was surprised because I don't go there. I don't like their coffee. It's too bitter. Well, how do you, how I drink do you, their iced tea, so I don't know. How do you make their coffee taste good? You put sugar in. Right. Coffee is expensive. Sugar's cheap. You can take a 10 cents, well, not 10 cents in my world, but you, know, you yep. take a cheap black coffee, add sugar, and you get 10 times the price for it. So these women are walking in and out, and I'm sitting next to the hospital, and I have surgery in the morning. This is so weird. I'm watching. I say, okay, this is sugar. This is source of sugar. And I go across the street to the hospital, do my surgery f- for the morning. Mm-hmm. Then I leave to go to the, my office, which is close. And on the corner, at Shea, there mm-hmm. over there, yep. is the cemetery. And I go, <laughs> sugar, yep. sick, yep. dead. Yeah. That's the sequence. Don't put that in your uh, motto, your slogan, Starbucks. So, uh, yeah. So, so if you I, went back to the 1950s then, when we, people were drinking coffee like crazy, they weren't sugaring it up then? When did we start to sugar our coffee? It's been around forever, but remember, it, originally they were putting sugar, glucose, then they did the disaccharide, uh, which is a ca- table sugar, mm-hmm. and cane sugar, and that sort of thing. But once in 1974, they and actually it was Japanese, made high fructose corn syrup. And what is that? It's a liquid form of fructose, Mm -hmm. and it can be put in anything. I could take your chair that you're sitting on, make Mm -hmm. it in a powder, add high fructose 
corn syrup to it. And you would eat that and say, that's the best goddamn chair really? I've ever had in my life. Fructose up my shoe and yeah. it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Don't throw the clothes around. Out. <laughs> Just eat them. Because <laughs> artificial food, it's fiat food. It's fake food. Right. Sugared. Fake money, fake food. Well, how are they going to make this uh, genetically grown meat? How are they going to make the meat? And you're That's saying- another fiat. We don't want to do that. We want to get the, and well, back to the inferno out there. Uh-huh. So one of my writers said, well, see, and she's kind of on the opposite side of my opinion. Oh, see, it's big governments, big, big, big this. No, it's human beings. Poor Bessie, the cow, uh-huh. she was sitting out there in the 40s, munching away on the grass, and we had a war. So the government went over and said, hey, Bessie, we need you for the war effort. Mm-hmm. Let's feed you corn, fatten her up in six months, and they've never stopped doing that. Cows don't eat corn. They eat grass. They're ruminators. They make omega-6 or make omega-3 fatty acids, and you're giving them corn, which makes omega-6. That's very toxic. Well, how do we get them to eat? Why are they eating the corn? Are we sugaring the corn? Yes. Cor- well, <laughs> corn is carbohydrates. Right. So they're going to eat it. They just don't naturally eat it. Oh, no. Right. But that's the only thing for dinner in, I- in Kansas yeah. in those CAFOs. So we're eating meat that's produced by sugar, and we're getting omega-6 fatty acid. I mm-hmm. mean, that's all in my book. It gets a little deep, but no. No, you don't. But it tastes so good. Yeah. Omega-6 is sweet fat, but it's not good fat. You want omega-3, which is great fat. Well, that's the carnivore diet. All you have to do is eat a very little amount of meat a day, mm-hmm. and you're satisfied. If it's so, the right meat. It's omega-3. Right. Omega right. So you could eat that. So here's what happens. So let's say you eat a lot of uh, uh, breakfast, list, Quaker oats. There's a killer food. You know, oh, it's heart healthy. Yeah. Isn't Bullshit. That, oh. No, well, they paid the American Heart Association to <laughs> get that. It's all, it's all, well, back to the heart. It's yep. heart healthy. Yeah. No. Like that, everything is chasing the heart, making, if your heart's good, you're going to fall in love and produce oxytocin and have babies who are going to eat, drink Pedialyte and sugar up all the way through. Exactly. So you eat. <laughs> it's the circle of life. You start with uh, Quaker Oats. Mm-hmm tastes like crap anyway and then you got to put sugar on it or fruit to and keep doing that yeah. and you can never get to the bottom of that bowl uh-huh. and you will be hungry all day long you'll produce a lot of insulin insulin's the only hormone that can store fat on the body so eat that and you will be fat look at the food pyramid uh-huh. it's 6 to 11 helpings of carbohydrates on the bottom uh-huh. guaranteed if you follow the government's uh-huh. advice you'll be 300 pounds yeah, the, the the food pyramid is sort of generally looked at as just a big oops. Well, it's, it's a pay it's a pay to play. Yeah, I'm it's sure. A pay it's to like, play. oh no, we screwed that up. Right. You want to yeah. get on the bottom of that? You pay to get on there. If it's the top, is mm-hmm. the things that don't make any money. That's our government, USDA, and, and you know it's just human nature. And if they want to sell food that's cheap mm-hmm. and profitable. Then, of course, we have the medical system, which I'm fortunately part of. Mm-hmm. All these hospitals, have you noticed all the big hospitals going up in Arizona? Yeah. Oh, my God. Big money in sick people. Yes. They're after your gallbladder. If you have your gallbladder, you better be careful. Don't have an action in front of the... If I don't have a gallbladder, I just take a pill? Or, I, or we don't need a gallbladder. It's like an uh, appendix. Nah, you don't need it. You know, But it's very valuable. About a million a year taken out in the United States. Huh. Um, see, uh, great love listeners, you don't know what you're going to get when you tune in here. That is the glory of having a podcast for so long and having such a loyal audience. You're going to take deep dives on all kinds of subjects with me. This is all related to love, dating, and relationships, though, because as we talked about at the beginning, get bitten by the love bug. You need to know what it is. You need to be able to understand your own uh, physiological and emotional reaction to what is happening or what kind of could happen or what did happen, all those kind of things. Yeah. Um, we play something, this is your first time on the podcast, we play something called Worst Date or First Date. So think back to your swinging uh, single 20s um, at, or whenever and say, what was the best date you've ever had, best first date you've ever had, or the worst date you've ever went on, if you have one? Well, the best first date was my first wife. I, I remember that. Um, and it was over dinner. And it was in Philadelphia, where I'm from. And um, she must have fed me a lot of oxytocin because it worked. 
<laughs> there you go. Get a cheesesteak in Philly. Yeah. There you go. But that is true. You brought that up earlier. That's, that was a really good point that we sort of glossed over. The dinners getting shorter and getting churned and getting in and out and get to the drink really doesn't provide that hour and a half of relaxation to get to know each other that we really used to do on dates. The dating has changed. The time spent on a date has changed. People don't even now on a first date want to commit. They're like, oh, no, that seems like a long dinner. And they don't want to commit to that. They're scared of like wasting their night on or two hours of time with somebody they might not like. We used to do that all the time. We used to go out to dinner and sit there until we got to know each other. And not feel rushed. Music, environment, tablecloths. Yep. That's all important. It, it is. changes. It's really not about the meal. It's about the communication. About the, the, the setting and the ambiance. And, uh, right. you know, you want to go out to a romantic dinner? People don't want to do that on a first date anymore. It's, they're, they're scared of it. They want to uh, carry the tray and then go play miniature golf, I guess. Um, all right. Plug your books, please. Well, Sugar Crush been out there for about nine years. Um, it's still a pretty good seller because now that message that I had is in there about all these different diseases. But I think you're going to like Unglued, which will, should have come out this month, but I keep adding stuff to it. I can't stop writing. People are listening to this in 2026. It's yeah. probably out by now. <laughs> okay. So my big um, point in Unglued is, yes, you're eating sugar, you're 40, 50, 60 years old. Big, I, okay, I got the damage. How do I get rid of it? And stem cells are the real message in unglued. How can you reverse the effects of sugar? And stem cells in all its form, believe me, fixes anything. Really? Oh, yeah. Because stem cells, this is what I say, stem cells don't give a rat's ass what you call your itis. I have this, have this every day. Well, you don't understand, doctor. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Do you think they understand that? They don't speak English. I've been to Dr. Reardon's clinic in Panama, which is the best clinic internationally, and they don't speak Spanish either. They just go where the inflammation caused the damage. It's that simple. Stem cells will fix your broken heart. Uh, <laughs> oh, I like that. People. Um, all right, this was fun. I really appreciate you doing this. Pick up a copy of this book. Check out his podcast, uh, Dr. Rick Jacoby. As far as us, like, share, follow. Please review this podcast. Your reviews still after all this time, mean a lot in the podcasting ecosystem. Uh, shoot us an email, greatlovedebate at gmail.com if you have questions, thoughts, medical conditions, um, stem cell, or uh, high-level fructose. Shoot us an email, greatlovedebate at gmail.com. Go to greatlovedebate.com. Tickets are on sale, I believe, now for a handful of live shows. Uh, one we are doing right here in the Valley of the Sun at the Tempe Improv. We have not done a show in the uh, Phoenix area since 2015. So very bad by me. It'll cool off by the time we do that, and then we will um, heat it up that night. Because as always at the Great Love Debate, we never stop making love. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>